All right, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, this is the CEAS session on uh, CPT, OPT, and co-op. Um, so we have James Tenney here from UC International and Christy Stewart um, from the College of Professional Studies and Cooperative Education. <laughs> Awesome. Um, so they're going to be presenting. Uh, so I'll just pass it over to James. Great. Well, um, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to cover today a little bit about the immigration stuff, work permits, like curricular practical training and optional practical training. And then Christy's going to talk a little bit more about the, the co-op process, the job hunt process. And then at the very end, hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A. But everything we're going to talk about today is being recorded. And also everything we're going to talk about today is on our various websites, whether it's UC International Services or through Christie's site uh, with C CEAS. And so with that in mind, I'm going to share my screen here for a moment. For a moment. I'm going to take a oh, Kelly, can you please give me the ability to share my screen? Yes, I'm sorry. I'll make you a co-host. Great. Thank you. Something happened. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to bring up a screen here and uh, we'll go over this information as as uh, quickly as we can so we can get to some of your questions hopefully uh, okay, slide. okay so our contact information for UC International Services is is located right here and so we are located in Edwards Center 1 room 7148 we're right there across the road from Walgreens and Kroger on that side of campus. So you probably pass by us when you're doing your shopping. Um, stop by and see us if you have questions. Our phone number is 556-4278. Our email address is international.services at uc.edu. We are open Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. unless it's a national holiday or inclement weather is closed just for, for whatever reason. Um, email and phone are always the best way to get hold of us. Saves you a bit of a walk. But if you prefer the in-person uh, connection, you can always stop by our office during those business hours and uh, we'll be happy to try and answer your questions as best we can. Now, most of you are in F1 status. If you're not, uh, well, you're gonna be a little bit bored here, but if you're in a different status, let me know at some point in the Q&A and we'll talk a little bit more about what options are available to you. But from an immigration standpoint, for an F1 student, you're gonna have practical training available to you. And practical training is a work permit that allows you to get experience in your field of study, whether it's a good ex good ideal experience or if it's required for your degree program, for example, co-ops. There are two types of practical training. One is called optional practical training, and the other one's called curricular practical training. Optional is just what the, what the uh, title suggests. This is not required for anything, but it's good optional experience. And you can use this optional practical training either before or after graduation. Curricular practical training is also in the name. It's curricular in nature. It's not just a good idea, but it's fulfilling a degree or academic requirement. You have to do this employment or this experience in order to graduate. And so if you don't need, need this experience to graduate, you're using OPT. If it is going to fulfill a degree requirement, you're using CPT. Generally speaking, everyone in order to be eligible for OPT and CPT must have fulfilled at least one full academic year, typically two semesters, of in-person classes full-time uh, at UC. And so if you are someone who came to us as an H4 and you've done one full-time semester in H4 status and you've done one full-time uh semester in status and F1 status, then you are eligible for OPT after that second semester. You don't have to be in F1 status for um, both semesters to qualify for either one of these work permits. So let's talk a little bit about curricular practical training or what I'm going to call CPT for this presentation. CPT again is for you to gain actual experience in your field of study that's necessary for you to complete the degree. Uh, it could be anything. It could be a work-study relationship, an internship, co-op, which is what most of you are here for, or any kind of required practicum or, or internship, however that's labeled within your particular college. For CEAS purposes, this is pretty much going to be co-op. This can be paid or unpaid experiences, so EEPs, for example, that take place in the U.S., 
that's going to require practical training. Why is that? This is not only a work permit, but this is also describing to the immigration service, why is it that you're only registered for a couple of credits in a certain semester? Well, that's because you're taking part in a required practical experience. And so maybe it is, and most likely it will be, some kind of work experience that is paid. Some of you may not be able to find a job one particular semester, so you'll do a research EEP. That is also practical experiences. Co-ops done outside the U.S. still require the submission of the CPTE form. This is so that we can keep your immigration record active. No CPT will be issued for that particular semester unless you are working for a U.S.-based company overseas. Then CPT is necessary. But if you're working overseas for an overseas company, you won't have to have CPT issued, but we do need the CPTE form Submit it so we can approve it and keep your F1 record open for that entire semester. Failure to do any of these things in a timely manner would result in your F1 status being terminated. And that just puts you way behind schedule if you're trying to come back and continue your classes and your co-op experiences. So that part there, let's go skip a little bit here. Now, here comes some math. So CPT is unlimited. You can get as much CPT as you need in order to fill a degree requirement. And so if you need five semesters of co-ops in the U.S. and you're going to do five periods of CPT, we can do that for you. However, if you engage in 365 days of full-time, not part-time, but full-time CPT, you are ineligible for OPT for when you graduate. So some of you may be thinking, well, I am gonna be needing five semesters of co-op to graduate. How do I do this without losing my eligibility for OPT that I can use after graduation? Well, some of you may wanna do some of your co-ops overseas um, with an overseas company. Certainly those, again, won't be issued CPT, even though the CPT e-form needs to be submitted, you won't be issued CP CPT for those overseas co-ops that meet those requirements. And so that may be one way of navigating that particular part of the process. Some students may wanna use some of their OPT before they graduate. So for example, let's say you use four months of full-time OPT before you graduate for one particular co-op term, that will leave you with about eight or nine months of full-time OPT for when you graduate but you will at least still have some of your OPT available to you. All official UC co-ops are credit bearing. And so even if you do them on campus, you will need CPT. If you're doing a regular on-campus job uh, for no credit whatsoever, some of you may be working for Aramark in the kitchens, or maybe you're working in the UC library, you'll know that you can work 20 hours per week without CPT, of course, and full-time during the summer semester. However, if you're in a co-op program and you're going to use your on-campus job as that co-op experience, that's going to require CPT to be issued, and all co-ops are full-time. Now, just a reminder again, also, if you're here in the U.S. or doing an EEP here in the U.S. or overseas, that still requires CPT to be issued. Okay. First step in this process is to submit your CPT e-form in iBearCats Global. There'll be a question there saying, who is your academic advisor? If you're in a co-op program, use your co-op advisor. We put academic advisor because there's many other CPT opportunities for other students out there that are handled by the academic departments through their academic advisors. But if you see that academic advisor question, please put in your co-op advisor. Once you click submit on the e-form, that co-op advisor is going to receive an email saying, is the student really on co-op and have you reviewed the job opportunity? Does the job opportunity actually meet the co-op requirements? Do the dates meet the co-op requirements? Because you have to be working or taking part in an experience for a certain number of weeks to qualify for co-op credit. Once they click submit themselves, letting us know that they've reviewed the e-form and they agree with your submission, it'll take us five business days to issue the CPT. So 
make sure you understand if you get a job offer on a Friday afternoon, don't tell your employer you can start Monday morning. It's just not going to happen. Um, we have well over 4,000 students and five to 600 scholars we're responsible for. We will get to your request as soon as we can, but we've also got some very critical issues we've got to deal with. So five business days is pretty quick. And U.S. employers are used to hearing from other employees as well as American employees saying, great, thank you for the offer. I can start in a couple of weeks. That's perfectly normal for you to use when you're talking to an employer. Once we approve your application, you're going to be issued an I-20 via email, and that is your permission to work. You cannot start working until you get that I-20 from us. So we talked earlier about the CPT option where you may be uh, losing your post-completion OPT, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But again, you know, doing some of the stuff outside the U.S. or using some of your OPT before graduation are options available to you to save your post-completion OPT, OPT eligibility. So with that said, let's talk about OPT, Optional Practical Training. Every student in F1 status gets 12 months of optional practical training per higher degree level. What does that mean? That means if you graduate with a bachelor's degree, you get 12 months of OPT. If you decide to come back to UC or go somewhere else and get another degree a master's level, when you graduate with a master's degree, you get another 12 months of OPT. What this doesn't mean is if you go straight from a bachelor's to a master's degree, that you get 24 months of OPT. It doesn't mean that. It means, you know, if you go from a bachelor's to a master's and don't use any OPT and then graduate with a master's degree, you only get the 12 months of OPT based upon that master's degree. So 12 months for everyone per higher degree level as you achieve different degree levels. Students in STEM fields, listen up, this is CAAS. Uh, you can obtain a 24 month extension of your OPT. And so that will be applied for during your 12 months of OPT. So everyone applies for the 12 months of OPT, you get the, the employment card, and then at some point during that 12 month period, near the tail end of that 12 month period, you can apply for a 24 month extension if you are in the STEM field. There are some conditions about the STEM extension. In order to get the STEM extension, you must be in a STEM degree, you must be on post-completion OPT, and you must be working for an employer in the E-Verify program. We'll explain that one a little bit later on as well. For those of you in STEM fields, you can apply for a second STEM OPT period if you again obtain a different higher degree level. All right. Employment is issued on an employment authorization document. This means we are involved in the process of helping you get the card, but ultimately the immigration service is going to be issuing the card. This requires fees, unfortunately. Everyone has to pay the $470 fee. And if that's the only thing you pay, then the processing time will be 90 days. And if you plan ahead, and I tell students this all the time, if you plan ahead, there is no need for anyone else to pay more than $470. If you don't plan ahead, or if you just prefer to get this quicker, you can pay a premium processing fee. You see it's right there. It's $1,685 on top of the $470 fee. That will guarantee a response from the Immigration Service within 30 business days. Not 30 days, unfortunately, but 30 business days. Saturdays and Sundays are not business days. So, but again, if you plan ahead, you shouldn't need to, to apply for premium processing. If you know in February that you're graduating in April, that's a good time to apply for your OPT card and, and doesn't necessi necessitate the, the payment of the premium processing fee. Again, if you are job hunting right now, maybe you're spending that last semester in a co-op semester, and you can tell your employer, great, I know I'm going to work for you after graduation. I'll have my OPT situated by then. Maybe in your full-time classes and you get a job offer in February. Let the, your employer know. It's going to take me a few months to get the OPT card. However, you don't want to hire me anyway until I have my degree. And so that's why I'm, you know, everyone's going to be waiting for you to get your degree and your OPT card. How to apply. 
It all begins with iBearCats Global again. You go there and submit the OPTE form. Your academic advisor is then going to get an email from us, not your co-op advisor, but your academic advisor. And they're going to say, yes, we know they're graduating in April or December or August, whatever that is. Then we get access to your e-form and then issue an I-20. There is a video there on the linked here, and it will be also, again, when you look at this video again or on our website, it's linked there as well. We have a video then that explains how to upload your information into the US CIS portal. So there are two basic steps here. First one, submit your stuff in iBearCats Global. That's got to be done first. Then when you get the I-20, you can then go to the US CIS portal and upload your materials to formally apply for OPT. And that video explains how to do that. Two warnings here, do not start the USCIS part until you have the I-20 from the OPT recommendation that we're going to give to you from iBearCats Global. If you start the process, even by opening up and starting an account, and then attach your I-20 to this, the Immigration Service recognizes that and will deny your application. So do not start the USCIS portal until you have the I-20 from us through iBearCats Global. And secondly, and here's some tricky dates, and I get this can be a little complicated because the government loves to make things complicated. When you get the I-20 from our office, you must submit the application to USCIS within 30 days of that I-20 being issued, but no sooner than 90 days prior to your graduation date. So let's talk a little bit more about that with, with some um, examples. Let's say you know you're graduating in April. You can start the process in iBearCats Global in February. You don't have to have a job offer to start the process. We then issue an I-20 to you from iBearCats Global. You then got to take that I-20 and go to the USCIS portal and submit everything into the portal within 30 days of that I-20 being given to you. But that date also must not be more than 90 days, three months, before your graduation date. All right. When you uh, apply for the card in three months or in one month, if you did premium processing, you're going to get an employment card that looks a little bit like this. You have a start date, end date, and your date of birth. There's no longer a fingerprint. And then you can go ahead and start working based upon the start date on the card. When the card expires, you have a 60-day grace period to do something about your status, whether it's leave the U.S., obtain a new I-20, or to change your status. While you're on the OPT for those initial 12 months, you must be working in your field of study. You must be employed at least 20 hours per week. It can be volunteer or paid. And you must not accumulate more than 90 days of unemployment. Let's say the start date's August 1. You don't find a job until August 30th. That's 30 days of unemployment. You work for six weeks, and then, I mean, you work for six months, and then all of a sudden you quit your job, and there's a 30-day gap between your job. That's 60 days of unemployment. Once you hit 90 days, you no longer have OPT, and there's no grace period. So I would tell you this. If you get to the 60th day of unemployment, during those initial 12 months, contact us. We can then tell you what your options are before you hit that 90th day. Temp agency work is okay. You can even be a startup. Any changes in your employment, though, let us know through iBearCats Global within 10 days. And always make sure your mailing address is secure. Is it reliable? Does it have your name listed on the mailbox? Or is it with the local post office they know that you do actually live at the address you say you do? And real briefly, and I'm going to then pass this off to Christy, 24-month um, STEM extension near the, near the end, but before your OPT for 12 months expires, contact us by submitting the application in iBearCats Global for your STEM extension. To qualify, you must be on post-completion OPT. You must be in a STEM field. Your degree is from a STEM field here in the U.S., and you work for an employer that's enrolled in the E-Verify program. 
e verify is an optional program not everyone's in it but a lot of uh, employers are trying to get in it because they know they can hire their students for a lot longer there is a list and this may help you determine who you want to work for after you graduate maybe you have two offers company a is really into what you are doing research wise and you're excited by that but they're not in e verify Company B, maybe, yeah, it's in your field of study. Anyone can do this with your degree, but they are an E-Verify. So maybe that's going to sway your decision of which company you want to work for. This doesn't mean, though, that company A couldn't apply for E-Verify while you're doing your OPT. And so maybe during your interview or maybe while you're working for that employer, you can bring up the topic and say, hey, why is it that we're not an E-Verify? If you did that, I could be hired for a lot longer if you like my work. And so take a look at that list very carefully. That may help decide where you want to work for someone. It's also a good indication if they are in E-Verify that they, they definitely do hire F1 students. And I know some of you may have concerns about that as well. The same fees apply, the same processing time applies. Um, when you get the card, you get an additional 60 days of unemployment eligibility if you're hunting around for jobs, put on top of the 90 days that you had before. And so keep that in mind that if you're still hunting for jobs uh, during that STEM extension period, then you have a little bit more time to accumulate unemployment time. Okay. And so with that in mind, I'm going to wrap up my part of the discussion and pass this off to Christy. So I'm going to stop sharing. James, there are a couple of questions. I don't know if we want to just address a couple quickly before we move on or save okay. all the questions. Yeah. Let's do that. And then I want to give, make sure we give Christy plenty of time though. Okay, somebody asked, can you please explain again how we can utilize OPT before we graduate? Yeah, certainly. So let's say you have, you're in a co-op program, you're getting close to using a full year's worth of curricular practical training. You don't want to go overseas to do a, do a co-op opportunity. You want to keep a relationship up with a current employer. That's great. That's what OPT can be used for if you don't want to use any further CPT. Same process as if you're applying for post-completion. You start off with the e-form at iBearCats Global, submit the materials. Your co-op advisor will say, yep, they are in co-op for fall semester. I agree with this uh, arrangement. And then uh, we issue the I-20. You submit the materials in the USCIS portal. And then in 90 days' time, you're going to get the uh, the employment card. And it will be good for three months or however long the, the co-op semester is. And then you could use your OPT for that period. If you use three months of OPT for, in that way, then you're going to be left with nine or so months of OPT for when you graduate. And so that's how it essentially works. Thank you. And then we'll just address this um, one other and then move on to Christie's. But somebody else asked, is there any way we can check how much time is left on our CPT? Yes. And so take a look at page two of all your I-20s. Page two is where your work permit, your curricular practical training is going to be listed. And basically, you, you can go online to an online calculator for dates and count the days between the start, starting with the start date and ending with the end date and count them all up, including those Saturday, Saturdays and Sundays. And that tells you how many days you've used for full time CPT. And that tells you how many full time days on CPT you have left. Part time CPT is not a consideration and does not affect your OPT. Thank you. Okay, so I guess it's my turn now. So hi everyone, my name is Christy Stewart. I am a faculty co-op advisor in engineering. I work with aerospace and biomedical students. So today I'm gonna talk to you about the co-op part um, for engineering students um, and how that works for you specifically as international students. So by the end of today, you should be able to understand the engineering co-op requirement basics and then use some tips for navigating co-op as an international student. Okay, so just getting into your co-op requirements. So some of the basics, you should know this already, but just to review, you are required to do five semesters of co-op. This is required for your engineering major. So in order to graduate, you do have to do five semesters of co-op. There are some exceptions. 
<clears throat> but for most of you, it will be five. James said, talked about this before, but you have, in order to do a co-op first, you have to complete one year of classes. So that's about 30 credit hours over two semesters. In engineering, you should meet that requirement because typically your programs are 15 to 18 credit hours a semester. So that should be okay, but just kind of pay attention to that, especially if for some reason you're dropping down below what's typically advised for you to take for your program. And then once you complete that, then you're able to start your co-op when your co-op advisor tells you that you're able to start your rotation. Your co-op experience needs to be full-time to count as a co-op. That means 40 hours a week. It should be paid. So James mentioned that CPT could be paid or unpaid for your engineering requirement. It has to be paid. So pay attention to that. Um, and it has to be an engineering experience. So you can't just go get a random job, but it does have to be an engineering job. However, you might be in a very, really specific major. So like for example, aerospace is very specific and narrowly focused. So a lot of students, not just international, but also American domestic students may not have an aerospace specific co-op, but they might have a mechanical engineering co-op or a manufacturing co-op. That's okay. That counts because it's in engineering in general. So that's okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about CPT. James explained so much about this already, but I just want to highlight a few points again, um, that are important. So as he has talked about a lot, you have 365 days of CPT. So if you finish that last day, as he said, you will lose your OPT. So that's what you're gonna do. If you plan to work after graduation, you'll work with OPT. So you wanna be really careful with managing your days and keeping track of that, especially if you're planning to work after graduation. And to emphasize again, it does include the EEP program, which is the Experiential Exploration Program. This is a program that sometimes students do if they don't find a co-op and they need to do something related to co-op for that semester, or sometimes students opt into that instead of a co-op um, in industry. So this could be like maybe you want to work on a project. Um, or maybe you want to work on a certification. There's a lot of things you can do in this program. Um, so some students might think, well, I can do all this at home in my country. I can go home and work on the certification. That is true. You could go home. However, it will still count towards your CPT, as James mentioned. So regardless of where you are, the EEP will still count towards your CPT. And then just to reiterate too, it also includes the CPT time, also includes weekends, any days off that you have, any holidays. So it's really just from the day you start your um, co-op to the day that you finish. All those days in between count towards your CPT time. Okay, so you have some options um, for how to arrange your co-ops. So as an international student, you can do all five of your co-ops in the US. You could, you could do that and then you go back home after graduation. You could totally just do them all here and then just go back home after graduation. That is an option. Or you could do three of your co-ops in the US and then do two somewhere else outside the US. Then that gives you the option to use OPT after you graduate. You might be thinking that maybe you're not sure what you wanna do, stay, go, who knows, not sure. If you're not sure, then just do the second option. That way you keep that option open to you. When you get ready to graduate, you can decide then if you want to use OPT or not. Um, so I would just recommend maybe just doing that one to be safe. Okay, so to, just to reiterate, if you're planning to do OPT after graduation, if you want to work in the U.S. after graduation, that means you can only do three semesters of co-op in the U.S. So really important to remember that. So again, your co-op requirement is five. So you can't just like try not to do the other two, you have to do five, um, but again, three can be in the US and the other two, you have to figure out what else to do for that. So we're gonna talk about what to do for those two semesters outside the US. So again, this is the option if you're planning to work with OPT after graduation. So the first option is to find a co-op in your home country. So you could do all of, your two co-ops um, at home, or you could do all of your co-ops, all five at home. That's fine too, if you wanted to do that. 
So really now I would really start working on networking with family and friends, start talking to them, start trying to find out, really give yourself as much time as possible to work on that. So you can feel really comfortable and not get really stressed trying to find something last minute. So start talking to people now and start trying to find some opportunities um, for when you will need to do your co-op. Try to figure out how people typically get jobs in your country. Um, so it could be, there are lots of different ways people get jobs. So try to figure out what that is. Talk to people, talk to your family, talk to friends. Um, if there's common websites that people usually use, look at those, start looking up postings, just start gathering research now on, on that process. You can also use LinkedIn to connect with people who are working in your country and ask them for advice. So anytime that you're trying to network with others, you don't wanna just ask them for a job. That's not really how that works. You wanna ask them for advice. So you could say something like, hey, I'm you know, in this major and I'm looking for a co-op or internship. Sometimes it's called internship. Um, and I'm looking in this area or in this particular company. And do you have any advice for me on how to find a co-op or how to get um, considered at this company, right? So that, and then people will respond and give you some advice. And that's kind of how that process goes. All right, so the, your first option is to look for an opportunity at home. Next option is to look for a co-op in another country. Um, so you can absolutely go abroad to another country. Um, so the first way you can do this is to find an opportunity on your own. So you can, again, look at job websites, try to research how to find co-op opportunities in other countries, find an opportunity. And then once you have that job offer, then you would go through the UC Worldwide Experience Program. Um, and this will make your co-op official and it will count towards your degree. So that program is called Worldwide Experience. The second option is to go through the International Experience Program. This is for one semester. They have actual co-op opportunities that you can apply for through this program. So you don't have to go looking for the opportunities. They have some available and you can apply for them. So these take place in Singapore, Vancouver, in Germany, Italy, Tokyo, and Australia. But one thing to note is that a lot of these might be unpaid. So remember we said for engineering, the requirement is that it must be paid. However, because if you go through this program, then it's okay if it's unpaid. So that's the exception is this program. So that's okay, but that's something to consider, right? Because it's not paid. So you probably, if you're gonna go to another country, maybe that's expensive, you probably wanna get paid, but you know, it's still an option available to you. Okay, so another option is international co-op program. Um, you may have heard about this one before. It's very popular, both with domestic American students and with international students. So this occurs for two semesters. So if you plan just to do this one, that would take care of those two semesters and then you don't have to worry about the rest of them. That'll take care of it. So this takes place um, in co-op rotations four and five. So your last two co-op rotations. Um, spring through summer. So basically, and you wouldn't come home at all. So you would go like in January, stay there all the way till August, then you would come back to UC and do your senior year. So that's how that would work. There is a GPA requirement, a minimum of 3.0. So just be mindful of that. And there are some languages and other classes required for the certificate program. It is a certificate. So, you know, some of the programs might require a language. So you would take those classes. Um, and then there's a few professional development classes you would have to take. Um, so it's a nice opportunity if you're interested in learning another language, or maybe you already know another language and that's a way to use it. Okay, so that's one option. And then the last option for finding a co-op somewhere else is the UC Global Research Labs program. So this is one to two semesters and it's a chance to do research in another country. Um, so that's really great if you're interested in research, there is an opportunity to do that outside the US. There is a GPA requirement of 2.8 for that one. And they have locations in Taiwan, Spain, France, and then Japan, they're working on this one. Um, and getting a lab um, partnership set up there soon. Okay, so those are all your options for how to find a co-op for those two rotations. 
You can go home, you can go to another country, you can do some of the UC programs, the one semester program, the two semester ICP program, um, or you can do the research program. So a lot of options. So don't worry, be positive. There's a lot of um, options available to you. Okay, so as I said, you could do all of your co-ops outside the US, that's totally an option. But I think for a lot of you, you probably do wanna find a co-op here in the US. So I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about a few tips um, just for um, finding a co-op here in the US, um, specific to you as an international student. <clears throat> okay, first, so we wanna talk about your eligibility, right? So you can't just apply for all the jobs. There are some limits to the jobs that you can apply to. So you wanna check the postings for the eligibility, if there is any eligibility listed there. Some positions require U.S. citizenship. So any position that is through the U.S. government, um, working for the United States government, it's gonna require citizenship. It's probably like that in every country in the world. So you can't unfortunately apply for those. There are also a lot of companies that work for the government. So they're a private company um, in industry, but most or all of their work is for the government. So then you would not be able to work for those either just because the work that they do requires citizenship. So these are typically called government contractors um, or Department of Defense contractors. You'll see a lot of that in engineering. So some examples might be um, like Northrop Grundman um, or Lockheed Martin. You'll start to become more familiar with those companies as you're starting to look for co-op opportunities. And you'll see that a lot of them list um, that you have to be a citizen. However, the position description should include this information. So just make sure that you are reading the position description carefully to look for that. And if you don't see anything listed for citizenship, then definitely apply. Okay, so another option is to consider research. So a lot of international students do find opportunities on campus at UC in a research lab. So if you wanna find the research labs just in engineering, you can go to the engineering website which is ceas.uc.edu, go to the research tab and you can see all the labs that we have just in engineering. Um, the research positions, sometimes they're posted in PAL, uh, sometimes in Handshake, but more than often, it's a kind of a different process to follow to find a research position. So what that means is you need to go look at the labs, find a few that you're interested in, figure out what professor is in charge of the lab, and then you want to email the professor directly and just introduce yourself, tell them that you're, you know, in this major, you're looking for a co-op position for this semester, whatever that semester is. You saw their lab, you're really interested in X, Y, Z that they're doing at the lab, and then ask them if they would happen to have a need for a co-op student. And sometimes they might say, no, we don't. Sometimes they might not answer. Um, or they might say, yeah, actually, we might. Um, do you want to come by and see the lab and talk about that? If that's the case and you get that opportunity, you want to treat it like um, a job interview. So you want to be really prepared and dress well and have copies of your resume. Think about what they might ask you. Uh, be prepared to talk about yourself um, and have a few questions for them about the lab and the work that they're doing. Um, you can also involve your co-op advisor so they can give you some advice as well. But that's typically how a lot of the research positions are found. Um, your co-op advisor may have major specific places to check as well. So make sure that you check with them. So for example, in biomedical engineering, a lot of students might um, have research opportunities through Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So there's a website and there's a whole process that we advise students to follow when they're looking for positions there. Okay, so that's about research. Another tool that you could use is Handshake. So everybody's using Handshake, but for you as an international student, there is a filter that you can use. Um, and this will help you find companies that are open to hiring international students. So to find that you would go to job postings, go to all filters, candidate qualifications. And there's a lot of stuff in there, but just scroll till you find where it says CPT, you can check that. There's one for OPT, you can check that. There are a variety of things there. So just check anything that you are looking for at this point. You don't wanna check all of them or too many things, just the one that you're looking for right now. Um, just check that one. 
And then that will show the jobs that uh, for companies that are open to hiring for CPT or for OPT. Your co-op advisor may have a list of international friendly companies that have worked with UC international students before. So don't be afraid to check with them. Um, and then also don't limit yourself just to those companies because there are a lot of companies that just don't know anything about hiring international students. So you might have to advocate for yourself. So let's say you get an interview with a company that you know doesn't say whether they hire international students or not, and it comes up that you're an international student, they may feel hesitant about having you as an international student. So at that point, you can respectfully educate them on your status and what that means for them. So you can tell them, you know, I have work authorization, I'm allowed to work, I'm on CPT, curricular practical training, my school is taking care of all the legal stuff, you don't need to do anything, you can treat me just like any other American domestic student, there's nothing you have to do on your side, you can hire me just like anyone else. So you can definitely reassure them and take the time to explain your status. And I can tell you, there are so many companies where they just don't know any of that. I mean, I talk to them all the time. And so, you know, they may not decide not to hire international because they think that's H-1B and that's expensive and it needs lawyers and it's not a guarantee. So they may feel afraid of it and avoid it. Um, so sometimes it just might be the fact that you may have to talk about your status and help them understand that it's okay to hire you. Okay, so kind of along those lines, what we just talked about with your status, you may see sponsorship questions come up on applications. So how do you answer this? So the question might be something like, do you need sponsorship now or in the future? So now, do you need sponsorship? No, you don't. But in the future, you do have to answer yes, because theoretically, you will need it at some point, maybe not for a while. Maybe you're not planning to work um, past your OPT. Maybe you're just thinking you would go home, but still in theory, you would need it. Or let's say you aren't planning to work for that company after OPT, you wanna work somewhere else. Well, still somewhere else, you would still need sponsorship. So you do have to say yes. It's really important to be honest on that question because some students have had their offers rescinded, which means that they were had their offers taken back because they weren't honest about that. They will find out, they'll do a background check. Um, there are a lot of ways that they can find out that you're an international student. And that just creates a really bad experience for you. It's a, you know, it's really disappointing that you got that far and you got an offer and then now it's fallen through and maybe you don't have much time left before your co-op semester starts. So really you wanna think about targeting those companies that are open and willing to work with you. Um, and also it creates a bad experience for the employer and for UC. UC works really hard to get good relationships with companies so that our students can find positions. And some companies may feel like they don't want to work with UC anymore if they have um, experiences like that with international students from UC. So just be really careful with that. Try to be honest. It'll help you and it'll help other students too. So again, just don't, you know, don't spend time on that. They will find out. Really just focus on those companies that are really open and welcoming to you. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my slides. So thank you so much for your time. If you want to see my slides, I have a lot of links in my slides with the programs and different um, resources. If you want that, you can send me an email and I will send you the slides. Um, so my email is christystewart at uc.edu. So just k-r-i-s-t-y dot stewart at uc.edu. Um, or if you have questions um, just about in general how to search as an international student, you can definitely ask me that too. Um, if you have questions specific to your major, you should definitely work with your co-op advisor instead because they may have specific um, advice for you regarding that. And of course, if you have questions about your CPT, OPT, all that legal stuff, you should work with UC International for that. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. And Kelly, I think we're going to start taking questions yeah, so there were some questions in the chat. Um, somebody asked if we convert full-time course to, to part-time, will we be eligible for CPT and OPT? Is that a James question? I think that was a James question. 
<laughs> All right. Well, let, let me think about the question. So, so first of all, for co-op credit to be awarded, one must be in a full-time experience. Full-time means anything more than 20 hours per week. Um, and so if the question is, can you convert it from full-time to part-time, I'm not entirely sure you wouldn't qualify for co-op credit. And so therefore you wouldn't get CPT. So for your co-op experiences, you're always looking for full-time experiences. If you're confusing full-time meaning permanent and part-time meaning a temporary job, you're going to have to break yourself of that habit right now. Um, if you're talking about getting a temporary job and then you're, you're doing that for a couple of semesters and they want to hire you on OPT for a permanent job, then yes, you would switch from CPT to OPT at some point at graduation. If we're talking about hours, part-time hours versus full-time hours, then no, you can't switch from full-time to part-time and meet the co-op requirement for the credit. Did that answer the question for whoever asked that? And I would just say too, if you're talking about coursework, as an international student, you have to be full-time coursework. So you have to always take full-time credit hours. So it's not really an option to drop down to part-time. There may be an exception to that for maybe a semester, um, but in general, you need to be a full-time student. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's a good point that Christy's bringing up as well. If you're talking about classes are too much for you or something like that, there are certain reasons that the immigration service will let you drop below full time if there's a medical situation or if you're failing classes or something like that. But again, that's the immigration side of the piece. You need to talk to Christy and your academic advisors at this point about, you know, the engineering program is so structured that if you fall behind in one semester, you may be missing out on an entire year's worth of sequencing in order to graduate on time. So. Again, the, as I keep telling students, plan ahead. Talk to us as early as possible about any situations you're having. Maybe we can address that with tutoring. Maybe there's some other creative way we can uh, help you make up a class or there's a waiver or something like that. Um, the later you come to us for advice, the fewer options you're going to have available to you. And then somebody asked for CPT, are we only counting for weekdays or that includes weekends for jobs? Includes everything. Yeah. Because, you know, we don't know if you worked on a Saturday or a Sunday, or maybe you were off on a Monday and worked on a Saturday. So CPT doesn't recognize the differences between uh, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Sundays and Fridays and whatever. And so um, when you count those days on page two of your I-20, you're counting all the days. You can't just deduct out Saturdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. And then somebody asked where CPT is for 20 hours, how can this be counted in respect to the 12 month max of CPT? Right. So if you're in the co-op program, you're using full-time CPT. There's, there's no, there's no ifs or buts about that. However, if you're not in a co-op program, if you're viewing this from a different college, for example, um, there are some courses and, and internship programs in other colleges and degree programs, which may say, hey, you have to do a part-time job in order to fulfill this academic requirement. That will be 20 hours a week or less, 20 hours per week or less. And part-time CPT does not get counted towards the number of days that would affect your OPT eligibility, only full-time CPT periods. And then this is kind of a few questions in one. So I don't know if I should go one at a time or um, if they're kind of can all can all be addressed together. But somebody said if one has a part-time CPT offer, can they work on campus jobs for more than 40 hours? Do okay. they need to get CPT authorization as well? Okay. So Part-time, again, I'm going to say is defined as 20 hours a week, 20 hours per week or less. If you are really in a program outside of CES viewing this, this uh, presentation, then you may be in a program that allows part-time CPT off campus. Um, that is a separate authorization from your on-campus employment. And so if you're going to work for PNG 20 hours per week or less, 
to fulfill an internship requirement or a class requirement, that doesn't stop you from working on campus 20 hours per week during the fall semester or the spring semester. Uh, during the summer term, if you're in a non-co-op program again, you could conceivably be working off campus 20 hours per week in a part-time position um, and still work 40 hours a week on campus, and that's perfectly fine as well. But that's how we're defining part-time employment in, in this scenario, part-time being 20 hours a week, 20 hours per week or less. Yeah, I think that kind of addressed the other questions that they had as a part of that as well. Yeah. Um, so then somebody asked what to say if the employer asks, um, do you need sponsors now or in the future? So what to say, yes or no. So that's kind of like you guys were talking about how UC covers kind of the, the work authorization, but I guess it doesn't really address that like or in the future part of that. First, yeah. what, what do you advise people? Yeah, so in the last slide, I talked about that. So you can say, do you need sponsorship now? The answer is no, because you're good. But in the future, yes, you do. So again, even if you aren't planning to work for them in the future, even if you don't know if you're going to try for H-1B, even if you're not planning on H-1B, still at some point, theoretically in the future, you would need sponsorship. You're not a citizen, right? So you need some sort of authorization. So the answer is yes. So now, no, future, yes. So you have to answer yes for that. And if they combine that question together, then you have to say yes. You do need sponsorship, unfortunately. And see, it, and, and so I'll disagree with Christy here on one point. And okay. This, this is the beautiful part of the U.S. <laughs> employment system. Um, I... I some people could make the argument, and I, I totally support Christie's answer. Um, I would also uh, suggest that some employers would understand if you put, if that question is combined, you can say, no, you don't need sponsorship at this point. Three years is a very, very long time. And at some point, the employer may change their mind and say, yeah, we want to keep um, you know, Eduardo for a lot longer than the three years. Let's sponsor him. Um, mm -hmm. Or you may move on. You may move on to a different job. And so I think both answers are legitimate, especially if they're combined in that one way. But I totally agree with Christy on the fact that uh, if it says now only, then nope, you don't. If it says yeah. if it separate in the future, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a maybe option. And so I don't think any employer will be upset if you uh, checked off yes for a combined answer like that. Yeah. And I would just say like, uh, that's kind of where my mind was too for students because technically as a STEM major, you have up to three years of OPT. That is a long time. The typical time anyone in the U.S., um, international or domestic, stays in a first job is like two years or less. So it's not really reasonable for them to expect you to stay that much longer. So technically for a first job, it is okay to say, no, I don't need sponsorship because technically you should be fine. However, we have had some employers get upset because mm. students have said no. Um, so that's kind of why I'm like, well, maybe you should just say yes to be on the safe side. And that's even probably, though, uh, totally yeah, agree. absolutely. Yes. You what you guys feel is the safest way is not safest way not to upset employers. That's the key. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. so we're trying to find that balance. So it is tough. It is a tough question. Yeah. Um, and then we have, hi Hamza, he asked, uh, can we work part-time with our co-op employer for a semester without classes? What about part-time classes? Okay, so you said the magic word co-op there. No co-ops are part-time. And so in order to fulfill the co-op requirement, true co-op requirement, it's going to be a full-time co-op and you're not going to be enrolled in classes at the same time. You could be enrolled for some classes that are optional, but if you're really in a co-op program, you have no required classes to take part in during your co-op experience. Now, if you're using the term co-op liberally, not in the literal UC sense of a co-op program, maybe you are not in the CES program, you're in a college of business where, let's say they use the word co-op for almost any kind of job opportunity, meeting any kind of academic requirement, but it's really an internship or something along those lines then yeah, if they only require part-time practical experience in that co-op program, then you're going to be enrolled full-time for classes at that point in, in the College of Business, for example. So if you are in CES, 
you're only getting full-time CPT. There are only full-time co-op requirements. If you're in another program viewing this at the moment, you'll need to check with your academic department on what they consider to be meeting the co-op internship practicum capstone requirement for your program. And if it's part-time, most likely you are required to be enrolled full-time in classes anyway at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have, uh, does UC help in foreign co-op, meaning visa and sponsorship things? Yeah, so if you're thinking about getting a co-op position in another country, yes, if you go through um, ICP, the International Co-op Program, or the other one that's just for one semester that is typically unpaid, UC will help with that. If you find a position on your own, then like UC is a resource, but you'll have to kind of navigate a lot of that on your own. So it just kind of depends on which program you're going through as to how much help you'll get with that. Um, and then if we use pre-completion OPT for two of our co-ops in the U.S., do we still have the ability for STEM extension? Yeah, so, so the, the three requirements to, to utilize STEM, to be eligible for STEM, is, of course, the E-Verify part and also are you in a degree that requires STEM. The third component is are you currently on post-completion OPT? So it can be for 12 months of post-completion OPT or five minutes of post-completion yeah. OPT. As long as you are, you still have a few months left of post-completion OPT to apply for for when you graduate. Um, what that means is as soon as your OPT starts, you're probably coming right back to our office to apply for the extension almost immediately. If you have 12 months of OPT eligibility for when you graduate, then we're not gonna see you until probably eight or nine months later to apply for your STEM extension. Um, and then if our CPT ends during a co-op experience, is there any way to keep working without having to request OPT or do we have to stop working to avoid using the OPT? So I think the question is if they're in a co-op experience and it ends on at the end of the semester, which is what they do, and the employer says, boy, we'd like to keep you on longer through the summer, but it's not going to be a co-op experience. The answer is going to be no, you can't use CPT for that because it's not meeting a co-op requirement. Uh, but you could certainly apply for perhaps part-time OPT um, to continue to work part-time for that additional semester while you're back in your classes, um, meeting those academic requirements for your degree. Okay. Um, and then I have a direct message here. Is it possible to do one co-op abroad, three co-ops in the U.S. using CPT, and one more co-op in the U.S. using OPT before graduation? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, yes, this um, will be, this recording will be posted on our UC International YouTube. I can also send it out directly to um, everybody who attended this. Um, and then a last question that we have here, this is going back to Hamza's question that was related to the, can we work part-time with our co-op employer for a semester without classes? Um, he says, what if my requirements are already fulfilled? So Hamza, you mean that for some reason you have an extra semester? Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, um, but like you have an extra semester that your academic advisor would term like an optional co-op semester where you don't have classes, um, but you could do a co-op. I think maybe that's what you're referring to. Um, so I don't know, James, if you want to talk about that. I can I can clarify my question. If you're okay. Interested. Yeah. So my question is, I finished already my five co-op semesters. So let's say I just want to take a semester off before my senior year because I had that space in my schedule. And then I want to work with my current co-op employer during the summer. And you said, it doesn't count, part-time doesn't count for CCT. So is it okay if I just work part-time during that semester with or without classes? Would that be okay? And I'm an engineering student. Yeah, so from an immigration standpoint, um, there are a couple things here. So for CPT purposes, it would have to be an academic requirement. And so even though it sounds like to me, you've done all your co-op requirements and Christy, you can jump in here as well. 
Is there a part-time element that also meets a, a an academic program requirement for graduation? Mm -mm. No. Okay, so CPT wouldn't count in this case anyway. If you wanted to use OPT because it's good optional experience, um, then you could definitely use um, part-time pre-completion OPT, which will be 20 hours per week for like three or so months, but you would still have to be enrolled in full-time classes because that's an immigration component to all this. You can't take a semester off and do a part-time uh, employment opportunity like this. Now, having said that, if you are doing this during the summer semester, there could be a little bit more flexibility in you using full-time OPT for the summer, because if you've met all your academic, if you've met all your co-op requirements and your courses are structured, your classes are structured in such a way where you don't have to take any classes during the summer, then you could explore doing a full-time OPT for three months during that summer semester. But if it's spring or fall, nope, you got to be full-time in classes. And, and that I'm OPT. And that three month window would take away from your OPT time after graduation, right? So instead of 12 months, you would have nine months instead. Something like nine months or yeah, if you did three months full time uh, over the summer, you have nine months left. Mm -hmm. If you did uh, three months part time, that equals to one and a half months full time. Okay. You would have like nine and a half months left for when you graduated. OK, that's helpful for me. Or 10, 10 and a half, something like that. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. I'll probably have to ask more about my specific case, but that would be like later on. Mm -hmm. All right. That is all the questions that we have in the chat. Um, so and we're past time. So thank you everybody for joining. Um, yeah, we will post this on our UC International <laughs> YouTube. We'll try and get that posted here in the next day or two. And I can also send this out to everybody who attended. So thank you all. Thank you. Good luck.